Christopher. Right. I have, over the last uh, couple of months, looked through, like most of you have presumably for your presentations, a lot of research papers on the topic of serious games. And as you can probably tell from the screen, I have mostly been focusing on their impact on cognitive abilities, particularly in the field of uh, assisting people with uh, reduced cognitive abilities, as well as with a side dive into the field of empathy, wherein I have been looking through video games, serious games in particular, as well as other art and literature, which have a potential impact on the empathetic feelings we have towards other people, especially the people in those games and how it translates to real world groups and individuals. And if having empathy for people in serious games can assist us in building empathy for people outside of serious games. But in order to do research, one must first search. And it's a lot easier to search if you know what your goals are, what you are intending to find. As such, I have made a series of uh, research questions which I attempted to answer, uh, which can be seen here. It's broken down into a series of four different research questions. The first one, trying to aid again in the concept of trying to figure out what exactly are the things that I'm looking for? What metrics, what taxonomy am I going to use to define a serious game? Because the general explanation of a game which does not have empathy at its core didn't seem entirely satisfying as a metric to me. Secondly, once I know what I can define as a serious game and how, which serious games are relevant to this kind of research based on the taxonomy that I choose, I have to figure out how can I look at the impact that such a game may have on cognitive abilities or on empathy uh, in a more concrete sense, because I need to figure out how I can see if it has an impact or not. Thirdly, what benefit or detriment can serious games have on mental development based on those, uh, those factors that I discovered in uh, question two and what has been done on that, in that field. And finally, fourth, a bit of a deep dive into empathy specifically, whether or not narrative empathy, empathy for individuals in a, uh, a fictional setting, one could say, is something which can be cultivated by serious games and what implication that has for serious games in general, if that is the case. So a rather broad spectrum of questions with a specific focus perhaps on uh, narrative empathy for the group discussion towards the end. All right. Well, I guess we'll have to start with figuring out how exactly do I define a serious game? There are across literature, including our own course, a number of uh, common definitions, which all have the same elements inside of them that are defined. Uh, serious games are games that can be used for purposes other than entertainment, games with an element of pedagogy, pedagogy? I don't know how to pronounce that. Games which do not have entertainment, enjoyment, or fun as their primary focus, or games with a primary design objective other than entertainment. The problem which I found with these terms is that they are vague, if that makes sense. 
games used for purposes other than entertainment can be most games. Games with an element of pedagogy can also be a lot of games because it depends on how you look at them, how you use them, and what you as a user believe about them. There's not necessarily anything that guarantees that during the development of a game, entertainment, enjoyment, or fun was not the primary purpose. And especially the last one, the primary ob design objective being something else in entertainment is not that easy for the average researcher or user to figure out since, well, the design is the design objectives are confined to the mind of the designers. You don't normally get a, a box with a game inside of it with the design objectives written on the back. That's just not something that you usually get. So all of these definitions rely on the subjective uh, opinion of users, the hard to measure or sometimes even impossible to find intentions of the designers and other similarly unclear and overly inclusive uh, boundaries, which don't, in my opinion, lend themselves to a scientific definition. Um, so I have been looking through a number of papers and I found one which had a definition and a taxonomy for uh, serious games, which I personally felt was more agreeable than these common ones, at least. So I used it in order to separate out the kinds of serious games, which I believe to be relevant in this kind of research. And that is the definition proposed by yeah, Fatma Lamati, I don't know how that is supposed to be pronounced, at al or at alumni or whatever, at al is the short for. Ali, Latin, at Ali, Ali. Right. and the Ali, -E, two eyes, the Ali. others. Mm. Um, but uh, yeah, cool. Yeah, it's a well-known uh, definition. Yeah, good. Continue. Yeah. Um, which is an application which consists of experience, multimedia, and entertainment. And they have this little picture which shows what they mean and the... Uh, how do all of those three fit together? I personally still feel like this leaves something to be desired because of the choice of the word experience. What they mean is that a serious game is a application which has elements of uh, multimedia in it. So sound, visuals, etc all of that good stuff, which can also be found in computer games or simulations, which is entertaining and also provides the user with the experience of somebody that is knowledgeable in the field with know-how in the field or experience gained about the thing that the game is about. Experience, in my personal opinion, is a very generic word for that because it can also mean that the user receives an experience. They, they have an experience with the game, which then takes it back to the, what I believe definition of a, a video game is, something that delivers an experience to the player. So I would probably suggest changing the word experience to something like insight, an insight provided by the game to the user, about the subject or an insight from somebody that knows things about the field placed in the game for the user to learn. So yeah, I would change that specific part, but overall it's still a pretty, except for the word choice in that regard, I think it's a fairly good definition of what a serious game is. It is a, a computer game with the additional element of it uh, providing some some insight into a field or some knowledge about a field or yeah, something that goes beyond simply entertainment. 
which again matches up with the previous statements, but makes it a little bit more concrete. They also propose, based on this, uh, a taxonomy, wherein they divide serious games into a series of different fields and a series of different options within those fields, namely uh, where it is used, what kind of uh, activities are stimulated by the game, uh, how it interacts with the player, how the player interacts with it, and what kind of environment it is meant to be played in. Uh, you can see there's a pretty in-depth number of things here, whether or not it's used for education, training, other things, activities, physical exertion, mental, all of this basically. And that, again, was helpful in trying to figure out exactly what the goal of what I'm looking for was. What are the serious games which can target cognitive abilities and empathy. So yeah, from this list, I, I looked through this and I found a number of uh, application areas and specific activities that I felt were the most promising to find the games that I felt were relevant to my research goals. And I came up with uh, these criteria for modality and uh, input and the environment i figured that that's pretty varying you can have serious games that target the things that i'm looking for in all of those so i'm more focused on the application uh area and basically to find that yeah the activities that you're going to be doing are mental you are going to be training your cognitive abilities and your empathy which both are non-physical uh things to train. So it's it's going to be mental activities. And the specific applications for the serious games, which I will be looking into, are educational games, games that assist in rehabilitation, uh, therapeutic education, so educating people about diseases which they themselves or their loved ones may have, and interpersonal communication, which, of course, has empathy as a big part of it. So these are, this is the goal. This is the the kind of, the thing that I'm looking for with these, uh, with these serious games. These are the games that I am going to focus on and look through some studies done on games of this nature to find the impact that serious games can have on cognitive abilities and on empathy specifically. All right, which means that this is, our answer to research question number one, basically. Ah, and here we have some examples for different games that are in these uh, in these categories. We have, for example, educational games, Minecraft Education Edition. I didn't even know that existed until I started working on this. Rehabilitation games that help people uh, with the oftentimes repetitive task of uh, well, rehabilitating themselves, getting their motor uh, activities back. I guess this does kind of count as a physical activity in this case, but it's again, it serves as an example for what a rehabilitation game might be. Therapeutical education, for example, the game Elude, unfortunately no longer available as it was made on Flash Player, which teaches uh, people about the, the feeling of having depression, how it kind of fields and what kind of uh, assistance and help you need in order to get through it. And interpersonal communication, such as this very, uh, very fun looking game uh, intended to simulate a conversation with the gentleman in the picture in order to train interpersonal communication. Uh, I'm sorry, this is the best picture that they had of the game on Google, <laughs> literally, unfortunately. So. Um, I presume it's just a very grainy looking game. Right, then we can move on to question number two. How can we define the impact that such a game may have on the cognitive abilities and empathy of its users? In essence, to quantify cognitive and abilities and empathy to the best of our ability, which is a pretty broad field. Cognitive abilities have is a is is 
obviously wide. There's a lot of things that the brain does, so there's a lot of ways to describe this. Some people might say IQ is very useful here. Other people may say that uh, other things are useful. I personally am mostly looking at uh, cognitive spheres, is what they were called in the documents that I found, which is basically just broad categories of mental capabilities, of cognitive abilities used to, for example, define the, uh, the impact of diseases such as uh, Alzheimer's disease, of strokes, of uh, uh, autism spectrum disorders, that sort of thing. And for empathy, I'll be looking at slightly more concrete things, perhaps, as in there are a couple of actual specific tests that have been developed that have a very high, uh, what shall we call it, reliability, according to the studies that I found, which is the Interpersonal Reactivity Index, or IRI, and the, uh, the EQ, the, the emotional equivalent to the IQ, let's say. So yeah, we're going to dive a little bit into those, uh, both cognitive spheres, interpersonal reactivity index and EQ, figure out a little bit more about what they are, how they've been used and what specific fields, video games, well, serious games investigating them or affecting them have been used throughout the years, basically. Uh, for cognitive abilities, I'm kind of splitting this down the middle a little bit because well, it's, it makes sense. There are a number of, again, different fields which serious games have been used at in order to target cognitive abilities. One particularly common one is to target people with reduced cognitive abilities, obviously, since those are the ones that benefit the most from building cognitive abilities due to uh, serious games. And because more common ways of training uh, these cognitive uh, abilities in people with those diseases are often marred by issues such as the fact that they are often not very engaging, repetitive, etc. In fact, they are often by their very nature repetitive because that's what's needed to restore cognitive abilities. So they can be very unengaging. Uh, such, I've listed a couple of uh, cognitive spheres which are relevant for different uh, fields of that. So for patients with Alzheimer's disease, uh, the things that are most affected are their memory, their, their planning skills, their ability to take uh, initiative in starting those plans, I suppose, and their perseverance in actually seeing it through to the end. While for stroke patients, uh, there's often the factors of their ability to retain attention in the things that they're looking into, as well as, again, their memory, which are most affected. Then again, stroke is, of course, a pretty broad field, depending on what part of the brain are affected by it. So these are just some more common uh, things that may result out of a stroke. Commonly, in regards to this, uh, serious games are used for both uh, treating as best as possible patients, uh, train both them and their potential, their loved ones, like I said with Elude, about their, their issues, uh, rehabilitating, trying to get them back to getting their, how to put it, their, their cognitive abilities back up to a level closer to what it was before they got the condition and preventing things like this from happening in the first place. Of course, you can't prevent a stroke, but there have been studies in the field of using, well, I guess technically everything that you use to treat Alzheimer's disease is simply prevention of it getting worse. You can't really cure Alzheimer's. You can just slow it down, basically. Um, 
so yeah, that's basically what exactly serious games are, for example, used for uh, when it comes to the area of cognitive abilities, as well as, again, patients with the uh, autism spectrum disorders who may struggle with several uh, cognitive uh, issues in regards to all of these fears, basically. Uh, though their issues are also often intermingled with social communication. So autism spectrum disorder kind of shows up in both ends and maybe a little bit more on the social communication side of things than on the cognitive ability side of things. Um, on the opposite side, on the empathy side, we have, of course, the EQ and the IRI. EQ being a self-reported test consisting of 60 different questions, each of which have, I think, four to five different levels of agreement that you can score them on, and ends up giving you a score indicating your level of empathy, while the IRI only has 28 questions and gives you results between 0 and 28, but it focuses on four different fields for subcomponents of empathy, we can call them, which is your... Uh, ability to imagine yourself in the shoes of a fantastical character, a fictional character, your ability to feel, I guess, just empathetic towards other people and see if you're seeing their, their suffering, your ability to think as if you were in the shoes of another person and the personal distress that is inflicted upon you when trying to uh, empathize with another person, how much of their, their suffering and their problems are affecting you, basically. Um, in serious games specifically, empathy is commonly ingrained into either just its own thing, basically, trying to invoke and teach empathy in people, uh, trying to train people in making social interactions by helping them figure out how other people are feeling, which is, again, something that uh, people with ASD, depending on where they are on the, on the spectrum, struggle with, uh, teaching how to uh, recognize other people's emotions, for example, is in big parts empathy and reducing bias towards certain individuals, for example, people with disabilities. Um, there have been several different studies that have been uh, con contracted, uh, conducted on all of this. I have particularly read through some which were about uh, attempting to increase empathy and reduce bias in care workers uh, across two different studies in the Netherlands and I think South Africa, uh, which were both linked as they were both using the same game. So that was interesting to see. And one about uh, teaching children with uh, attention, no, not attention, autism spectrum disorders, how to function in social interactions. Again, I just spoke a little bit more on that. So by this point, we basically know what what fields what what metrics we're basically using to gauge the effect of serious games on their users in this regard the cognitive spheres and the effect of serious games on them for cognitive abilities eq iri and similar things for the empathy uh, invoked in our users for well empathy so that answers research question number two, which brings us to question number three. What exactly are the benefits and detriments that serious games can have on mental development? Where well, I'm looking at, again, previous efforts made, previous studies done, successes and failures, of trying to use serious games in the field of mental development. This bleeds a little bit into the previous section, but I think that it's natural since both talk about studies in the field. This one just focuses more on the actual results of those studies. 
Uh, yeah, again, for cognitive abilities, I have looked at studies uh, in particular, which focused on the use of serious games in treating or treating, training, somewhere in between, I, I suppose, patients with Alzheimer's disease, trying to rehabilitate patients with stroke symptoms, and trying to train patients with attention. No, it's not attention deficit disorder. A lot of these mental diseases all start with A and have a lot of Ds in them, which makes it very difficult to differentiate them based on the, the shorthand alone. Uh, autism spectrum disorder, I meant. Disorders. Uh, and for empathy, I'm going to particularly look into cooperative storytelling, which is a big one, and something which I've decided to call simulation of care, basically, uh, whereby we are making the users of the serious games care about virtual characters, basically. Uh, all right, let's get on. As for cognitive training, as I've put it here, or serious games and benefits towards cognitive abilities, this is a story which is mostly a story of successes. There have been a lot of studies conducted on this, and many of them have shown clear positive effects of the use of serious games to further and retain cognitive abilities in both patients with uh, Alzheimer's disease and for stroke victims. Uh, for Alzheimer's disease patients, they have been basically made these uh, tests that they are made to do on a daily basis, on a near daily basis, wherein they are attempting to do everyday live activities. Uh, I think it's a natural activity test or maybe natural activity training wherein you take a daily activity, which an Alzheimer's patient will have to do by themselves on basically a daily basis, such as toasting bread or making a cup of coffee, making breakfast in general, and those sorts of things. And you monitor the patient attempting to achieve those goals and seeing how many errors they make, how many things they try and then give up on, and that sort of thing. Um, this has been fairly easy to translate into a, a serious game as just taking a test with very clear defined steps and knowing what is considered an error, what is you trying something then abandoning it, it abandoning it again is uh, something that video games can quite easily do. And I hope I have a picture here. Yes. So this was an example of something that was made, which is basically a simple point and click game where you go through the steps of toasting yourself a, a slice of bread and making yourself some coffee, for an example, in order to make these tests kind of a little bit more appealing to, uh, to patients. The game was specifically made to give feedback on what you did wrong and uh, try and kind of aid you along based on the individual patient's needs, more or less. It had some, uh, some ranking systems inside of it to try and basically know how much help a specific patient needed and give them just enough help to keep the task challenging without making it frustrating. And this proved to be pretty successful as it was seen as both more engaging and more motivating than these tests would have been in regular life or even worse yet as a, a pen and paper alternative. So that was uh, one of the major benefits that the study saw with this kind of approach to it. In addition to one of the major ones, which is making errors doesn't have any any consequences if you leave your toast in the toaster for too long in real life you burn your house down if you leave your toast in the toaster for too long in a video game you get an error point and that's it basically they're informed you left the toast in the toaster for too long so it encourages players to be able to try and retry these scenarios without having to worry about 
doing something wrong, which is beneficial in getting this uh, getting this to happen, getting patients to engage with this sort of activity. On the next uh, field, when it comes to stroke victims, there also have been tests for cognitive ability training. Here also, uh, one particular one which I looked at was in uh, trying to use VR in order to help restore a lot of different uh, mental abilities, which may be lost over the course of a stroke, trying to restore the ability to, do, again, do daily life activities, encourage working memory, uh, memory? memory uh, spatial orientation, attention, uh, and a lot of that sort of thing. Again, memory, attention, and uh, spatial orientation mostly. And the studies found that these tests, in order to be most effective, have to be done a lot. Studies in the past have shown that the best activities for training cognitive abilities are oftentimes, uh, wait, I have it written down here. Uh, give me one second. Uh, challenging, repetitive, motivating, and intensive. And challenging, repetitive, and motivating are, of course, things that video games are very strong at. Video games, if, if any of you has like a Facebook mom who plays Candy Crush or something like that, you know that video games can be motivating despite being very repetitive. <laughs> And challenging, of course, is entirely up to uh, trying to find the level of activity which a patient is capable of and making sure that the tasks remain challenging for them by either including several different uh, degrees of challenge, several levels perhaps, or by making it dynamically harder or less hard, depending on how well they're doing, if you're going to use some AI or something like that. And yeah, studies shows that retaining motivation Retaining motivation is a lot easier with uh, serious games. Games are inherently motivating. Games are, by their very nature, made to be entertaining, and being entertained not only leads to a better learning environment, it also means that you are more engaged to keep doing these tests day in, day out, and thus you're actually going to fully benefit from the cognitive training, from the rebuilding of your, your synaptic paths, basically. So that is one, uh, what I would like to call a pretty major success for serious games, since they are literally made to make repetitive tasks fun. That is, that is part of the point. Um, as for autism spectrum disorders, that's a little bit more on the fence about the, how successful that has been. Uh, there have been made games specifically for people with autism spectrum disorders. These are not examples. These are games which are available, which can help with certain things that people with autism spectrum disorder might struggle with. Um, the research done in this often is marred uh, by it being, how shall we put it, not necessarily up to scientific standard. The studies done on this can oftentimes have pretty major flaws in them about whether or not they are their results are kind of sure the not sure. Um, I'm trying to look for the word. If their results are basically uh, valid enough or reviewable enough to be really considered scientific. Representative? Representative, sure. Perhaps, I don't know, maybe. <laughs> uh, so yeah, there have been some some critiques of studies done on this in the, uh, in the ASD category, and results are definitely a bit all over the place. The good thing is, again, 
video games are motivating and engaging and oftentimes they are very engaging for individuals with uh, autism spectrum disorders who are often very visual people if that makes sense so video games specifically ones with like engaging elements colorful etc are often very good especially for younger uh, asd patients to keep them engaged though that can again go a bit too far where they're more intrigued by the game and the sounds and the the lights than they are actually completing the task so it's kind of a balancing act in that regard so it hasn't been as successful for for autism spectrum disorders than it has been for alzheimer's and for stroke victims specifically these kinds of studies uh moving on to empathy oh god right i forgot to make these pictures more animated uh anyway or maybe it's only when they're in full screen that they're animated that could also be a problem i'll try and keep that in mind serious games and empathy is a lot less cut and dry with what was successful and what was unsuccessful hold on i can see if opening it's in full screen no no it's just not working okay sure uh wait what did i do there we go not only has there been in the media at least a very common portrayal of video games having a a negative of empathy i'm sure we'll all remember the violent video games lead to violent behaviors uh, debate which is still ongoing somehow after all of this time uh, which i will not get into because that is not the focus of this and because of the oftentimes difficult to measure nature of empathy, as you perhaps previously saw with the uh, the IRI and the EQ, they are both self-reporting. So they rely a lot on the honesty of the individual person, as well as them knowing themselves well enough, basically to answer those questions correctly. So, that can be a bit of an issue. And the results as presented via those uh, two scores have also often been inconclusive, let's just say. There have been studies on uh, both trying to reduce bias in, uh, in participants. This was done in uh, a South African study in trying to reduce the bias of psychology students towards people with disabilities, uh, which showed that using a game called uh, World of Empire, which you can just, just barely see uh, the tiniest bit of here hidden beneath this wonderful picture, uh, which basically is a game where the player has simulated contact with people with disabilities and has to give them advice based on well what they themselves think is the ethical correct choice and then get feedback based on whether they chose correctly as well as an explanation as to what is the correct answer if they chose wrong um with the same study or at least a similar study being repeated on psychology students in the netherlands on a far grander scale uh, with a more general look at developing empathy in students. Both of these studies were inconclusive in their results, though both reported that the students which did play the game over a long time experienced a lower drop in empathy than students who did not. So as time went by, students which, for example, were handed a paper to read on empathy instead had a actual negative correlation to their empathy, which uh, one of the studies hypothesized might be due to either already knowing what was said in the paper or feeling personal distress because they were unable to do anything uh, for the people in the paper. While people playing the game actually reported 
significantly reduced levels of personal distress after playing the game. Which may be a sign that serious games are actually very helpful in making people uh, cope with these the often negative feelings that personal distress brings. Uh, feelings of yourself experiencing anxiety and that sort of thing about other people being uh, in turmoil and pain. So that was one conclusion on one side. The other side concluded that empathy retention was higher for people that played the game than for people that didn't. Uh, there was a similar study done actually in Antenu itself on a game called uh, Tapetina's Empathy, which is a game loosely based on a novel written by, I understood it as being a Antenu professor, which was a different master's project in its entirety, where basically a a, a game was made for cooperative storytelling and teaching empathy for the characters in the story through that, which again showed limited results. There was definitely some, again, slight increase in empathy, though there was no conclusive answer as to whether that was due to the game itself, or maybe due to just talking to other people and working alongside them or something like that. So again, inconclusive answers in that regard. Um, but again, there were records of increased empathy, higher empathy retention and reduced personal distress across several studies. So it's it's still up in the air basically, whether or not serious games have a a positive impact in that regard, but it's it definitely has some promising results, at least thus far. It just needs more research and more studies done on it, basically, to ensure that these are valid results and to better understand how serious games interact with the four different uh, factors of empathy, the whole fantasy, personal distress, uh, the ability to step into another person's shoes and just empathetic feeling towards others all kind of interact and how serious games target the individual pieces of that. On back to the uh, autism spectrum disorder side of things here, serious games have actually been used to some success. There are a lot of serious games attempting to help with emotional recognition. Uh, like the one we can see on screen here, whereby students are essentially taught how to recognize emotions in faces, either photorealistic or, like in this case, more stylistic. Uh, but again, the studies on this are, at least in the uh, in the eyes of experts on the field, oftentimes marred with being not particularly robust and often have very small sample sizes to work off of. So there's still a call for large scale empirical research into the effect of serious games on these kinds of uh, on these kinds of issues and the games are often also focused on people that are high functioning with uh, autism spectrum disorders so low functioning individuals are often not not taken into consideration with these kinds of games if that makes sense so yeah Less less concrete successes than the cognitive ability side of things, but uh, successes nonetheless. I would I would like to claim uh, overall. Um, what what time is it? Real quick. Okay, right. It is thirteen oh one, and I believe it is time for a short break. It's perfect timing, in fact. You are uh, spot on, I believe. So um, yeah, let's let's take a break until uh, 16 past to be correct, right? I guess, and continue then. Is that the intent? Yeah. Okay. Well, in any case, Leon, thanks for now for for starting and giving us a bit of a basic, uh, you know, introduction into um, you know both empirically what has been done, but also the uh, you know underlying conceptual foundation. So, but I uh, hope we pick up on this in a minute. Uh, well, in 16 minutes, in 15 minutes, I guess. Okay. See you in a bit.
Right. Well, uh, the second part of all of this is about the paper, which I requested people to read. And I'll, in a moment, open a menti to ask some uh, questions regarding it. Okay. Among other things, how many people actually have read it? <laughs> right, right. Um, just uh, before we do that, just a question: that, um, is, Are there any questions regarding the com um, the topics that um, Leon talked about up to now? By anyone questions? Because you opened up. I mean, to, as far as I'm concerned, you opened up quite a number of cans of worms. <laughs> we just need to see Certainly. which ones to avoid or not to avoid. Because you basically took the course apart. And said, "Okay, hey guys, let's look at it again." And I'm not really sure that I agree with whatever you have talked about so far in terms of serious games. And then uh, uh, draw a lot of different examples, especially from the area of healthcare, to kind of uh, uh, link back um, and kind of identify whether health. Uh, sorry, whether serious games actually seem to have have had any impact uh, on cognitive health in particular, I guess. Um, and, and, and uh, you know, I think you come to mixed conclusions, right? Is that is that a sensible assessment? That like... is a sensible assessment, yeah. As with any field, I believe that mm -hmm. studies will show both for and against, and it is up to us poor uh, researchers to figure out which ones are the more credible out of the two, basically. Or if they're both credible and they're simply in conclusion in the field currently due to the inherent difficult nature of quantifying and exploring the human mind as different as it is across individuals. Right. Yeah, so th that's the other point, right? So how, how unified can a treatment of cognitive challenges actually be, both in terms of the classification of the impairments, but also humans as, you know, in general, right? So if you kind of do a physical rehabilitation, I guess that's probably um, I'm on Olympia, or slightly more uh, standardized, but I think mentally that can be quite a bit more challenging. I see your point there. So customization, I think, could be a major difference compared to what you would have in um, in other settings. Hmm. Okay. Uh, well, if there's no if there are no questions, I believe um, then you're more than free. In any case, you are, but more than free to continue and uh, kind of drive the discussion around the paper. Um, yes. There were two comments in the chat which I have tried my best to answer oh, yeah. so far. Okay. Uh, I but, believe. Right. Yeah. The individuals would come back to you if you hadn't sufficiently answered those to date. Anyway. Yeah. Okay. Good. All right. So for the final part of this little uh, session that we're having here, I would like to look into one specific field of uh, empathy, which, oh, wait, there's something in the chat. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Physical serious games is an interesting field, which I think has a lot of merit specifically in the physical rehabilitation. Uh, field and VR currently is getting more, more and more common and gets more and more close to simulating actual real life behavior. So I think we're actually on a convergent path on that in that regard. Yeah, I, I think there's currently master thesis actually going on uh, looking into this specifically the linkage of uh, rehabilitation and VR uh, in order to kind of you know yeah yeah foster this. But I think the kind of tech is more VR, but implicitly it's a you know serious games kind of linkages um, there as well. Anyway, let's continue. Yeah. Right. Uh, a deep dive into what I would like to admit is a bit of a, a personal, personal indulgence. Narrative empathy. Empathy towards fictional characters and the the impact that it has on the everyday life of individuals beyond the fiction. Uh, for early examples of narrative empathy, one needs to look no further than empathy itself, or Einfühlung, as it was originally coined in German, of course, uh, where in the concept was originally about the ability of an individual to relate to art. Obviously, mostly paintings and works of uh, literature back in those days. Uh, nowadays, uh, extending towards 
other media, certainly. A bit of a strange off branch of empathy, one could say, as it is towards characters who, by their very definition, are not real. They do not exist, they have never lived, they will never live, for all we know. And the uh, fact of the matter is that the hardships and emotions which they feel and which they go through are also not real. And yet the human mind, wonderful as it is, can still make us believe in those situations, those narratives, and empathize with these individuals who we, in the full soundness of our mind, know are not real. This creates a bit of an interesting and hotly debated situation, wherein it fosters empathy without the ability to aid the individual who we feel empathetic for. We cannot save anyone in Game of Thrones, no matter how hard we yell at the screen and or book. We cannot lessen the pain of a character who has lost a loved one in our favorite, favorite work of art. And in many cases, even in video games so famed for their interactivity, we cannot avoid the inevitable tragedy that spurs our character into motion, the destruction of his village, the murder of his family. We are unable to act upon our empathy. Our empathetic reaction to the character's suffering, by its very nature, cannot lead to ethical action. This has been hotly contested as to whether or not this is an issue or whether or not empathy towards characters described in fictional works can have positive, wide-reaching, potentially, impact upon the way we view the real world. Some say that the dissonance between empathetic reaction and ethical, well, ep empathetic reaction and ethical action is problematic in that it encourages the act of feeling empathy towards another person's plight without actually taking action upon it. On the opposite spectrum of things, there are those who point to studies which clearly show that contact with social groups, even simulated contact via narratives and similar fictions, is enough to foster real understanding for that group and may change biases and personal opinions for that group. Again, this was already explored a little bit with somewhat inconclusive results by the study of psychological workers and their bias on people with disabilities, where it did show a reduction in decrease in empathy over time, which may lend some credence to this, given the fact that that was a single play session less than 20 minutes in a one-time scenario, and whether or not extending that to a longer and more thorough uh, study over perhaps months or years of getting interaction with a similar game might have long-lasting and possibly quite impactful positive effect upon the bias towards that social group. And nowhere is this belief in the representation of the many groups, the social groups, the classes and races of the real world, if you wish to call it that, more evident than in the literature field of Victorian realism, 
which the paper was in part on. And for the example provided in the paper, the man, the myth, the legend, Charles Dickens himself, you probably know him as the author of uh, A Christmas Carol, at least, if nothing else. Very beloved story that many people watch or read over Christmas, which details the life and times of one Ebenezer Scrooge, a rich person in, I believe, Victorian England, though I'm not sure if the, the place or the individual matters as much as the archetype and the story itself. A story about learning the quote-unquote spirit of Christmas, which has since been in part credited to Charles Dickens, that the spirit of Christmas and charitable giving are so intrinsically linked in the minds of people, seemingly. The education of one Ebenezer Scrooge via his ghosts into becoming more empathetic and caring towards uh, the poor as uh, symboli sim symbolized, symbolized by the uh, tiny Tim and his family household. Which, of course, perfectly, narrow, uh, perfectly mirrors what we are talking about. A group of individuals with the capacity but unwillingness to help being exposed to an experience wherein they are unable to act upon the events unfolding before them, but the experience itself having a long-lasting impact on them and making them take ethical actions towards uh, individuals belonging to the group they were exposed to during their fictional experience. As we can see, Charles Dickens himself pretty clearly believed in narrative empathy and the good it could have on society at large and people on individual level. All right. Before we move on to the next slide, I would like to open Mentimeter. Give me a moment. I have never in my life used this. Okay, that's not what I wanted at all. Uh, go out of full screen, open this. Uh, huh? Does that work? Present. There we go. Here we are. Uh, There'll be a couple of questions, and as I mentioned at the start of the presentation, there are two uh, two different mentees that I have to go through since the first one, unfortunately, only could have two questions. So if uh, the code is right up, oh God, okay, right up here, so people could just uh, answer how much and if they read about the paper, that would be very nice for uh, just knowing how much of the paper I have to re-explain or how much people already understand of what has been said, basically. I say I'll give this, let's say, three minutes-ish till five past half. See if we get more than three answers, four answers.
why I sit here waiting the full time when all everyone has already answered. How many people are currently participating? 19, uh, out of which well, 10, 11 have answered. Well, that's, you know, if you go to for two thirds or yeah, a bit more than a half, then I think it's usually quite representative in terms of uh, involvement. Yeah. Sure. Okay. We, I guess we can move on from based on this. Uh, I can always stay on the screen for a moment while I am talking. Um, yeah. Well, looking at this, this is mostly what I expected. It's a, uh, a pretty lengthy, pretty complex paper. It, and it that doesn't have quite the usual structure that one would anticipate, right? So it's a exactly. large narrative uh yeah literally it is and largely argumentative so it doesn't have the structure we're very comfortable with so i think um that uh, you know people should be forgiven if they if, uh, yeah if, if they if they didn't find it easy to follow this game so this game yeah this paper in the first place so uh, that's to be borne in mind as well but i think it's great to be exposed to this different forms of uh, articles and papers that you want to consider and read and they may also be relevant to your respective disciplines so in this light it's quite an interesting take let alone the topic uh, of narrative empathy anyway uh, back to you leon thank you uh yeah so there is an an overwhelming majority that has not read the entirety of the paper so I'll be uh, a bit more in depth when I'm talking about the uh, the points that I'm making, though you will forgive me if I don't retell the entire paper by heart because A, it is very long and B, even though I knew you weren't going to read it, uh, it's still expected that you read it. <laughs> So, but but the, the, first of all, that anyway. But but I think what what you can provide us with the essence, right? So it's the main point. You have right. started that already anyway. But I think uh, so. Everyone gets some sort of a sense and can participate in a discussion or at least share the views on the issues discussed. Yeah. Right. Uh, okay. Let's leave behind Menti for the time being and return to here and move on to the next slide. And. In fact, this is a more exploratory one, whereby, again, we're just going to be using the same Menti. And I'm going to uh, ask people to answer a few questions about their own experiences with uh, narrative empathy, and perhaps some questions which may not be that easy to answer. Uh, in the meantime, while everyone is writing about that, I guess I can talk a bit more about uh, the the essence of the book of the paper as described. So, um, if I can understand how this works, there you go. For the next question, uh, the paper in question has been essentially it's a a description of victorian era realism with a specific focus on the works of charles dickens and his belief and his critics disbelief in the concepts of narrative empathy uh whereby Many of Dickens' books utilize characters as uh, as symbols or as, as anecdotes, if you will, uh, about real people and the real struggles that they represent to the uh, extent that some uh, works of Charles Dickens have been so closely mapped to real individuals and real areas in uh, Victorian era Britain by his readers, that he sometimes uh, had to clarify very clearly that this was meant as a general commentary upon society and wasn't directly referencing any one individual or place or situation. Um, the paper mostly goes into several examples of this from uh, his characters being chimney sweepers or just general members of the poor masses, as well as Dickens' very clear propensity to 
attempt to make the reader understand that what they were looking at wasn't a, a fictional, a purely fictional thing. Characters like the ones that lived, loved, died and bled in his stories existed in the real world around them. And that while the readers had no ability to directly influence the characters in the book, they had the ability to directly influence people like them around themselves in the real world and give in whatever capacity they could in order to make those people's lives better. His opponents often state that Charles Dickens is not a realist. His works are fantastical, overly romanticized, and oftentimes are described to be closer to fantasy and myth than to actual fact. And as such, he cannot be, by their definition, a proper realist. One uh, critic likened it to, well, likened Dickens' readers to children, which if presented with a wooden horse, uh, would feel that it is more real in their mind than the uh, best paintings of horses presented to them by the best uh, painters because of their own imagination essentially filling in the gaps. Um, which, you, know, you can be on that side or this side in regards to that. The point of the paper in its essence is the, the discourse between the, the positives and the negatives of narrative empathy. Do people fall on the side of believing that experiences had with fictional characters having positive impact upon the uh, the actions that the readers take in regards to real life individuals or on the opposite side does it uh, result in just slowly learning to not act upon your empathy okay i think that is about enough time for this uh this Menti page to come come along quite well. Uh, it seems like there is a an overwhelming amount of individuals who have felt empathetic towards characters in fiction, which is probably to be expected. Uh, the amount of uh, times that people have felt that uh, they have been shaped by an experience they had with a character in media is pretty solidly in the sometimes category with only a few people saying that it has never happened and or that it happens constantly. While the uh, final question shows that it seems in the audience at least there is some people that feel like they have never or very rarely had a a positive change in outlook towards people in uh, real life based on a fictional experience. Uh, today is actually a surprising, I feel, amount of people that have a an, an often uh, or more number of experience uh, with that happening. So that's that's interesting to see. Our own small scale little experiment, I guess, on uh, on narrative empathy and how it impacts people right here. Can I offer a question or point of discussion? I'm not sure what it is, but I'll, um, if I may, one, the, the, the questions have prompted it. And uh, I mean, empathy is one of the most complex concepts that is discussed in, 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 in across different areas, both in science, but also arts and so on. And one of the challenges is there that uh, uh, I think that the major argument is that there are two forms of empathy. 
right? So we have on the one hand, the cognitive empathy that is like, you know, experiencing or realizing and rationalizing somebody else's experiences or uh, possibly own experience and so on and linking them uh, co conversely, right? So if you see someone else suffering, you, you kind of empathize and realize what, what that means, especially if it affects abstract resources such as, you know, uh, lack of money and so on, because that's not immediately, immediately you know, feelable or perhaps even visible per se, but it's realizable and you can kind of empathize with this issue. The other one is affected empathy and that is when you for example see someone physically suffering by pain so you feel the pain like like quite literally in fact uh, um, that you see so when someone else gets inflicted think about someone getting else getting uh, vaccinated <laughs> very timely topic and you know some people are very comfortable looking at needles others are not precisely precisely because that because uh, what will happen is that uh, they will spark mirror neurons that actually reflect in some way or fashion the pain that the other person experiences very much so so the question is there to what extent do you apply an empathy that is automated and innate to us in our nature, biological in kind, uh, in contrast to one that is cognitive in kind? And that's the, sort of the psychological one. And when you ask the question, has an empathetic experience you had with a character in media ever shaped the way you acted in real life? I was looking for the option, I'm not sure. I don't know because I wouldn't I, I, I had the sense that I wouldn't know if it would really, uh, you know, uh, effect, effectively uh, uh, make me change my behavior in a very tested and uh, uh, subconscious way or if I necessarily need to act on it uh, based on, you know, conscious realization. That's the, the that's perhaps the, the main point there. And I think it would be important to uh, think about. Uh, empathy as something that is uh, not balanced as in good or bad per se, but because it can affect both sh uh, shapes, but also to clarify where this concept of narrative empathy that is discussed here sits. Is it more of the cognitive kind or is it also relating to the effective kind uh, that, that you know, uh, people may experience? So Leon, that's a question to you just to, you know, just open the discussion, the floor a bit on this. Let me add to that. I had the same kind of question, and that, this also goes with uh, if you think about TV ads or any advertisement. People would say, "No, I'm not affected by it," but obviously sales increase. So, so somehow, so how good they are at actually uh, saying whether or not they are being influenced by these things is, is kind of hard. So I was thinking, can I can I really think about one specific? event one specific story where i could say exactly this formed me or my my uh, my action or my, my feelings and I, I couldn't say so but that doesn't mean that i wouldn't be a lot affected by it so so it, it's a hard it's a hard methodology question there mm. yeah i would actually uh, hypothesize that video games and other visual media are actually better at this uh, triggering what you call mirror neurons uh, thing than books are, for example, because I know for my personal experience, at least, if I see like a character in a on TV or something getting a grievous injury, like the bones coming out of the skin or something like that, that makes me cringe in real life very significantly. Whereas reading about it is something else. So yeah, again, that is uh, an interesting point to what extent um what we see versus what we what we i guess read what we perceive uh impacts how we feel empathy towards these characters uh right so you you would say that is more of the cognitive kind when you think about the narrative one right so that you need to more realize and rationalize it in in, in your own imagination as opposed to directly perceiving it right so that's the Right. Response yeah. that I got. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. Basically. Uh, okay. All right. Well, this is a fairly uh, fairly nice number of graphs that we have here. Uh, I will stop presenting this menti, I suppose, and move my way over uh, to the other one. And in the meantime, I guess I can move on to the next slide here. Um which is about exactly the conflict that has been presented in the paper between narrative empathy and uh, ethical action. On the side that narrative empathy has a positive 
effect on the actions that people take in regards to their common their fellow man is that indeed it has been shown over several studies that contact with other social groups even simulated contact is capable of altering the way that people feel about those social groups there is a very real uh, sense that narrative empathy field for characters inside of books and stories is very much still real empathy. You still feel for those people, even though you know that they aren't real. And there is, while there has been, of course, a lot of struggle trying to discover the impact that the Victorian era book had on Victorian era people in modern studies, uh, there is contemporary uh, evidence, at least, uh, as presented by a, 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 a piece of written newsletter, something along those lines, I presume from the time, called the, uh, the Gentleman's... Wait, hold on, I can find it. The, the Gentleman's Magazine, there we go. How uh, trustworthy of a source that is, one can debate. But at the very least, they did say that there was a notable increase in charitable giving after the monumental success of A Christmas Carol when it first came out and uh, attributed it to said book. Whether or not there are any like real-time records or something of charitable giving in Victorian-era uh, Great Britain, hard to say. But there are definitely contemporaries that seem to think that Charles Dickens' books had massive impact on the people that read them and actually caused real improvements in their current concurrent society. Uh, likewise, there is mentioned an interview with a cab driver who said that him and his contemporaries saw how Dickens wrote about chimney sweepers and those kinds. And we're all kind of hoping, oh, maybe he'll write about us next, basically. Maybe we're next and we'll uh, also get the same kind of treatment. So there was definitely, he had a lot of people that believed in his work at the time. And like any, uh, well, anything really, if there are people for it, there are people against it which have made the arguments that, again, by its very nature, empathy towards fictional characters prevents you from actually taking action on your empathy. There is, in fact, in Charles Dickens' books themselves, uh, depending on which of them you read, a very real fear that Dickens seemed to have that his readers would simply read his books and it wouldn't lead to anything but uh, you know, empathy for the characters in the books and not for people in real life, as symbolized by the character of Skimpole from, I believe, the book The Bleak House, if I read correctly and remember correctly, which is a character who describes himself as a, a man of high sensibility who hears about the tragic tales of uh, poor individuals and like art pieces and media and weeps. But at the same time abuses and neglects a poor chimney sweeper boy working for him, not making any moralistic connection between the characters in the works of fiction that he reads and the real characters surrounding him. Uh, so that clearly shows that even Dickens himself had some, some concerns that maybe his readers would not understand that it is he is talking to them and presenting them real world people basically as uh, abstracted into these characters that, that they had to take action in order to actually uh, make the world a better place yes Christopher so uh, uh, what I mean uh, uh, that's a very very nice opportunity in opening your offering here when you look at serious games what 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 is the concept that we're looking for that this dickens was worried about that his readers wouldn't get uh, or uh, pick up on the concept uh... the concept that is super essential to serious games that we're always measuring the success of serious games by i just oh, want to well, reuse the opportunity actually... to read yeah 
anyone, they, they, anyone right. should know this. It's not just to, towards Leon here, because we talked about this concept. And repeatedly, and that's essential. It's something, you know, how do we know that our, you know, serious games or whatever design, use or um, apply otherwise actually makes, you know, has any, 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 any value, right? So what's the objective of um, serious games again? Uh oh. Well, be, CS games should lead to behavioral change, right? So it's our main motivation, right? And how do we how do we achieve this? We spent quite a bit of um, time on this in the earlier sessions when we talked about um, the psychological theories and so on, and why we apply them. What do we want to facilitate? And but yeah, exactly, so Ivana, thank you very much. Internalizing something, right? And from a perspective of a serious game, uh, how how do we uh, how do we assess that the objectives of the serious games? are somewhat linked to the behavioral change. We have a term for this that we constantly use. And I just want to uh, um, challenge you to reflect on this. And, and yes, exactly, Ivana. Alignment, right? So we seek alignment. That's precisely, uh, uh, it appears at least, uh, Leon, you can qualify this uh, statement, but it appears that Dickens has precisely the same concern that his serious or not so serious game, meaning his novels, uh, you know, were not in alignment or did have, didn't have the necessary alignment uh, as measured um, by behavioral change, right? That he sought to to have when he uh, thought about ethical action, at least the way you present it. Um, okay, anyway, I just wanted to budge in briefly to, to kind of take up this opportunity. Um, I hope this representation makes sense to some extent. Uh, I'm just going to look through some of the responses that we've gotten in the chat so far. Uh, exploring physical series games. First of all, I already got that one. Self-reflection on this stuff isn't difficult. Most of our childhood stories are very much angled to feel empathy towards others and others' feelings and experiences. Yeah, mm -hmm. that is that is true. A lot of uh, Again, we're back to the whole storytelling aspect of developing empathy, which is uh, well documented. And as such, it makes a lot of sense that a lot of the stories that we are told in our formative years are about acting in a positive manner in society, you know, listening to the rules, taking the correct actions, feeling empathy towards people, that sort of thing is taught to us very early via those stories. So yeah, that is a... A very good comment. Thank you, Benjamin. Uh, saying the most empathetic sentiment to a video game character was in Fears and Watch Dogs. Quite strong build, I think it didn't make an everlasting impression on me. And again, do feelings create a chain in terms of inducing a visual effect of what you read as well? I'm not sure I understand that question. Uh, does feel Um, hmm. uh, feel free to explain that question further down the chat. I'm going to move on uh, to the next comment. Uh, broad, wholesome, charitable views of men and things cannot be acquired by vegetating in one little corner of the earth all one's lifetime by Mark Twain. Yeah, that can both be a, a common for and against, I suppose, in, in one way, saying that in order to... Uh, acquire broad, wholesome, charitable views uh, cannot be acquired while sitting in your own little corner. The entire your entire life necessitates you going out and actually having positive uh, or experiences with real people. But on the other side, it can also be taken to mean that uh, in order to broaden your horizon, you need to actually go outside of the uh, experiences which you can commonly have in your own immediate area or in your own little well, little corner of the earth, as the quote states, which can be very much achieved by, by reading. Reading broadens your horizon, I guess they say, and other similar uh, theater movies, that sort of thing. Telling stories that you would not experience in your everyday life normally. I guess, could also be seen as 
leaving your little corner of the earth in the widest sense, uh, perhaps. There was more so in the terms of visual effects of games and text in novels generally. Uh, yeah, I, I, su I suppose, yeah, both generate uh, feelings and emotions, Suraj. I, I'm just wondering if the so, effect of mirror neurons. Hmm. Yeah, so uh, my thing was, the comment that I made was, considering you said, uh, you talked about how the text uh, in novels and the visual effects of games, general games basically induces feelings and empathy, right? So I was wondering uh, about the reverse effect as well, wherein, uh, I mean, feelings basically inducing, like uh, if you read a text, does it increase the visual tendency of uh, visualizing that portion of a text if you have those sort of feelings already from a previous experience as well? So that in terms of chain was where my thought process was going. Right. That that's actually a good question if you already have empathy towards a situation does reading about it lead to a stronger visual representation of the actions in your own mind um perhaps i mean i guess it would make sense that you would hearken and remember your own experience if you read about something similar and that would perhaps give you a stronger visual a stronger visualization of the scene or perhaps you would just visualize it happening to you. I don't know, actually. Uh, that is something to definitely research, I feel. Uh, Benjamin, I was thinking to extend this to use media as a replacement for going out. Now people to expand it the same way. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, I guess it can be taken both ways, as in no matter what you do in your little corner of the world, you're not going to get broader, uh, more moralistic views unless you actually experience things. But I guess it can also be taken for to mean that in order to get those kind of broad views, you need to have a varied set of experiences which can potentially be acquired via books, games, movies, etc. So I guess it can be taken kind of in both ways, yeah. Uh, where was I? Ah, oh, yeah. Arguments against uh, narrative empathy. And right, the last one was basically that it provides a sense of escapism from real problems, that instead of uh, considering the feelings of real people and having empathy towards them, you can escape into the world of fiction and read and have empathy towards people in books and no empathy towards real people and think you're a good person because of it, basically, if that makes sense you blind yourself to the plight of your common folk by escaping into the blight of people in books and think yourself an empathetic and uh, caring person because you care about the people in those books without ever actually putting any care into the people around you. So in that regard, having listened to the comments made by the people in the chat as well as by the things presented uh, by me in this short introduction and by the paper, if you actually read it. Uh, I'd like to ask people about which side of the, the argument they fall on personally. So I guess the next menti then being, do you believe that narrative empathy fosters an increase in ethical actions in the individual? So do you believe that if you are you on the on the Charles Dickens side of things, thinking that if you read about characters going for experiences, or if you see characters going for experiences in video games or movies or something like that, you actually are more likely to behave in an ethical manner towards your fellow man? Or do you think that narrative empathy either has no effect on that or a negative effect even potentially? Or if you're uncertain, I guess you can answer that as well. We're going slightly over time, it would seem. I hope that's not too much of a problem. Well, that's the pattern you inherit from me, I guess. <laughs> um, yeah, I want to see. 
Yeah, Runa's comment is precisely what I had in mind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, but then you still do believe that it can foster a narrative, uh, an ethical action, just that it can foster it in some so, people more strongly than others. He is, he is, I'm not sure if that's your next question, but if I may, it. I agree that narrative empathy will foster increase in actions, whether they're ethical, I'm not convinced at all. Ah, right. That's an interesting question, of course. Because I'm, I'm not sure if I'm, I'm confounding your survey here, your questionnaire, but um, uh, you need to bear in mind that empathy is not one-sided. Empathy is not positive. Sci right. uh, sociopaths also have empathy. They have a lot of strong empathy, but they use it to you know, um, perform social engineering, to get in touch with people and to perform whatever intention they actually have without actually feeling or fearing for the other people's well-being at all. So it's not ethical, but nevertheless increases active action, of course. Um, maybe I should have just asked action in general. <laughs> but let's well, maybe, let's let's keep it to positive. Yes, yeah, maybe, maybe they think it's ethical. You know, you, you never know. Maybe it's not ethical. It's wrong. But maybe they are doing it. They think it's ethical. They think it's uh, beneficial. So they do it. <laughs> That's a good point. Ethics is also not, not, not a <laughs> hard and fast concept, right? Because it's uh, describing it from a matter of perspective and values. That you this hold. is exactly why looking into empathy and that sort of thing via studies is so difficult because it's so... It is. It's, it's such an individual uh, subject. Well, it's actually incredibly interdisciplinary. Right, so mm. you, you you want to look. I mean, you looked at it from a perspective of literature, but you should also look at it from a side biology, social psychology in particular, and economics. So it becomes really uh, a complex concept suddenly. Um, right. I think we have to keep moving. Yeah. No, I think we have time. a sensible. I mean, that is to some extent representative of what we are in, a, 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 you know, in our group. So yeah. Well, it has. It's a good, good sample I introspection, I guess. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, back to here. Oh God. Uh, okay. So it seems most people are on the side that uh, narrative empathy can have. Mm -hmm an ethical impact in some sort of sense, if I am reading the Menti correctly. So looking at all of this, what does that mean for serious games? We've just discussed at length in movies and uh, in texts. What does that mean for serious games? I mean, whether people like to call them that these days or not, it is still my firm belief. And I believe that by definition, video games are an art form and should be afforded the same classification as other art, like literature. Yeah and movies and similar media. It is a interactive means of telling a story, but it is a means of telling a story no less than a novel or a movie might be. As such, if there is a chance for narrative empathy to occur when watching a television series or a movie, then that by extension should mean that a serious game or a video game in general, perhaps even, which presents a story with ethical and empathetical uh, themes in itself can also, in the same way, invoke narrative empathy, which, as we just discussed, and as we came to the conclusion to, Several people here believe, based on the evidence presented, and several people throughout history believed can have a serious change to the behavior of individuals. An interesting tidbit on that, which some people may have noticed in the paper, is that the paper specifically mentions the fact that people were upset at the inclusion of these sociological topics in novels 
deeming them to be political pamphlets, essentially, which I find is very funny because it so closely mirrors modern outrage at putting video politics into mid video games. It's it's very much one of those moments where you realize that things really have always been this way. <laughs> people have been complaining about people expressing their opinions via art and media since the dawn of time, it seems. And even as recently as Victorian era England, we can see traces of people resisting the idea that political opinion should bleed over into art which I find to be quite interesting that that has been a thing for so long, seemingly. Um, yes. So that is definitely something to be... That sounds like a sensible assessment overall, I believe, um, on this mirroring and uh, also the, the politicized uh, view on serious games or whatever on art and so on. The problem is you can't get away from this because uh, if anyone feels that you're not touching on politics, you just raise it by one abstraction level and suddenly you're back in politics as well. So like, you know, it, it, every time you, you assume a viewpoint, a perspective and so on, you're de facto making yourself susceptible to this. It's unavoidable. For example, conversely, you could argue that um, the, the Scroogean uh, situation in, uh, in, in, in uh, Victorian England could be a reference to a failing state, right? Not so much to a failing attitude of its citizens, but the state as a whole. That's a political view as well. So as soon as you would abstract from the, you know, moral, uh, um, moralistic shortcomings of, uh, you know, the, the British people at that time, if you like, then, uh, you know, you would open up another can of worms of discussing the entire system in contrast to other systems that would have fared exactly. better at managing exactly. it. So um, it, it's inherently politicized. But anyway, that's slightly going beyond the point, I believe. Um, but I'm basically supporting your point that this observation will hold and will always hold, even if we try to avoid it. It will always be. I also find it interesting in the same regard that the uh, the current like major topic of contention in that is the inclusion of marginalized groups in games and the increase in the inclusion of marginalized groups in games which could actually, based on what we have seen so far, based on the previous uh, studies done, be an attempt at the induction, uh, well, the induction, the inducement of the same kind of simulated contact to marginalized groups that was previously discussed in an hope at an attempt to make uh, public opinion on these marginalized groups improved as bias risk reduced. So that would be interesting. Yeah, exactly. To normalize these, uh, of course, these yeah. fringe groups and to thus increase uh, public opinion of them in a medium which has been increasingly becoming more common across the world. There's a lot of people, especially younger people, who you want to target with this kind of thing that are playing video games. So it makes a lot of sense for this kind of attempt that simulated contact with fringe groups to occur through a medium which of course reaches a lot of people so yeah that's that's a, an interesting uh, interesting thing i feel personally to to think about mm -hmm. how this uh, this trend towards the normalization of individuals from marginalized groups in video games relates to the scientific concept of uh, increasing empathy and reducing bias via simulated contact. Hmm. So yeah, that's that's uh, interesting, I feel personally, and something that could be discussed. Definitely, Rich. Definitely, Rich. I, I think, I mean, when once you start writing your report, um, yeah, I, I would start feeling scared if I were you because uh, it will be hard to keep it below the page limit that we're suggesting uh, because there's so much of discussion points in there. So you'd be really careful with your framing to what extent you want to expand it and where do you draw the boundaries because you have to. It's a very, very rich rich view, but I really like the perspectives and the, you know, the, the that's why I started with the term lateral, <laughs> the, the multi, you know, multi-perspective viewpoints you need to apply in order to kind of capture and at least triangulate to some extent the concept and what, what it means in different contexts. So um yeah so but um can a immediate response to you leon and i think we should conclude it soon but i just uh, would be feeling very interested to see your questions and responses to this should we have a so 
for movies, for books and so on, in many countries, there are some regulatory standards that want to, for example, prevent, you know, the, the limit the use of, uh, I don't know, negative influence in the first place, but perhaps also to, you know, control content with respect to age groups and whatever. Um, should we have more of that for serious, sorry, for games in general then as well? Or worse, do we need to have state produced games to some extent, because we have that for books, think school books, um, that have the same function of normalization. Is that then something that uh, should uh, find introduction into video games as well, especially since video games are the primary contact of, you know, that age group with, you know, information uh, compared to television, at least uh, classic linear television uh, or let alone books. <laughs> I mean, put it this way, the, nowadays the, the, the consumption of books is not really increasing, but rather decreasing compared to increasing use or relative use of video games, whatever nature that would be. What's your thought on this? I mean, from a, from a regulatory perspective, that of course would have implications if you say uh, normalization plays an inherent role in other media and in video games. What does it mean from a you know regulatory standpoint? Um, while I do not believe myself to be qualified to uh, make assessments as to whether or not we need to tighten restrictions on video games or not, that is entirely outside of the scope uh, of this project and not something I feel personally comfortable, as well, yeah. like I have looked into <laughs> enough to talk about. Mm. I feel like uh, the state and education specifically would be benefiting greatly from uh, making video games and serious games to teach the values of uh, the uh, institution and or the the nation the state itself whether or not that is indoctrination and a bad thing is a matter of moral debate but I mean, the exact same thing happens via the views expressed in school books anyway. And so that is a, a much larger subject, I feel, than yeah, just yeah, I whether it should be I, video I, games. I, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. It was more like your, your sense that you may have developed while oh, yeah, thinking. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's, uh, um, that's, that's my stance. I, while the, the concepts of indoctrination can be discussed, they are, go way beyond video games, and I feel like... Serious games will have no more or worse impact, except perhaps being more accessible and more engaging than, than school books. Yeah, and perhaps only now, perhaps in five years, we're back to books. Who knows? Yep. Who knows? Yeah. That sounds, sounds good. I think we should leave it at this because uh, we are well over time. <laughs> um right. Yeah, in the future, I probably need I have... to schedule three and a half hours um, for those kind of sessions. Um... How much more material do you have, by the way? I have like, uh, a, a, if I make it quick, just one more question to the audience, essentially. Yeah, please, okay. So in lieu of what we've talked about, in lieu of what we just come to a conclusion on, that the video games can carry a very real uh, impact on people, if we say that a video game can make you love, hate, cry, if it can make you change the way you feel about people, empathize with their struggles, change your opinions, be scared, be sad, to care about these people and their plight. What does that then mean for our original interpretation of what it means to be a serious game? Because at the stage where the story of a game starts to introduce players to experiences which they themselves have not had in order to further empathetic understanding of a situation. Does that then mean that the game at that point is imparting an experience upon the players to further their learning of empathy in a multimedia context while using engagement and enjoyment as kind of a, a transporter for these experiences. In essence, if narrative empathy can foster and teach real empathy, are narrative games, by that definition given earlier, than serious games?
And I leave you with that. Feel free to write, write out your thoughts. That is, I know, a fairly big question to pose right at the end. And I guess that is more or less the end of my presentation from my side. Thank you all very much for coming. No, thank you for holding it. That's a really, really interesting one. Uh, I didn't see that coming, admittedly, um, which, 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 is, which is good um, because that makes it all the, more, all the more interesting to follow. And I think you leave us with a lot of thoughts uh, even after this session, right? So thinking about like... Um, uh, you know, having a slightly different viewpoint on serious games more generally and the relatedness of anything that is then related to imagination, right? So, I mean, hmm. uh, uh, because uh, again, uh, I'm, I have a reasonably strong viewpoint that I don't think that you can dissociate empathy from most of your other, other socializing responses or internalized responses, because there's always some, as soon as there's actorship, in my view, meaning there's agency by someone, by yourself, whoever, then there's empathy, because otherwise you wouldn't understand behavior. Um, so so um, your question, therefore, is incredibly general, right? So because you're suggesting then, you know, as soon as you're an actor in the game, de facto, you need to feel empathy, thereby de facto game will be a, uh, a serious game in your interpretation, right? So and I'm... The, the actual question statement could be a lot more lengthy and a lot more, uh, like, uh, precise, but I feel like... Based on what we've talked about, everyone understands the meaning of the question, essentially. If a game offers a narrative story where one feels narrative empathy for a character, would that make it a serious game? Are games like Undertale then, by definition, serious games? Seems like there's a relatively positive uh, number of responses so far. A positive mm -hmm. opinion in the uh, in the answers given up until this point, though a sort of uh, a layer of uncertainty with them as well. Mm. Yeah. All right. Cool. I, th I think that's where. Uh, yeah, I guess there could be a potential slight bias from this specific group, maybe given the. Uh, yeah, that's also a good question. Yeah. It's it's difficult to define exactly what makes a game serious. The, the boundaries are blurry. We discussed that before. Um, that's definitely one of the challenges of serious games. And it also comes back to the intent of the uh, designer. However, you can't always read intent. Exactly. Uh, especially in propaganda games section, that's uh, something that came out quite clearly. Uh, or news games even, then it becomes challenging to see this. Cool. Well, well, thank you very much, Leon. I think it's really great to to kind of you know um, bring this topic. Um, appreciate it. It's it's uh, you know really I, I appreciate how how deeply you thought about this and definitely thought about this uh, from 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 various viewpoints I mentioned earlier. So that's. Uh, um you know and uh, you detached it to some extent quite from serious games in the widest sense um you oh. know uh, but that could co have been to some extent more like a computers and societies lectures or uh, a bit of an ethics uh, uh, treatment if you liked on uh, um, I guess, media artifacts yeah. i guess the, the use of these individual pieces uh, in serious games was more of the red thread than exploration of serious games themselves, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's All, right. Everything was always brought back to how does this relate to serious games, what has been done with this in serious games, and that sort of thing. I guess oh, no, the no, discussion no, part definitely was more on the I, uh, general side. I, I don't have any doubts uh, this, but uh, ultimately the, 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 um, um, the trajectory of discussion uh, allows for this generalization, right? So it, it doesn't necessitate returning back to serious games, but it allows for this broad extrapolation and challenging of the whole field more 
more broadly, like including games, but also to any multimedia artifact in as far as it reflects agency. Right. It's quite nice. Cool. All right. Shall we leave it at this? I think otherwise we need to open up for another one or two hours. <laughs> and then we would violate the uh, expectation that there would be a 15 minutes break in between, which is, of course, the worst. Um, and in addition, you'd be too late for your <laughs> for your next course. Oh, thanks for reminding me. Yeah, OK, that, <laughs> that's a good point, actually. Um, yes, OK, we leave it at this. Thanks, Leon, uh, for <laughs> yeah, uh, assisting me in this. Um, and um, yeah, OK. Susan Tuck for the reflection. Um, yeah, if you have questions regarding report, Leon, we should catch up because that's a bit of a tough one, this one here. Yeah. Um, yeah. May I ask a question? Yeah. Do we have a lecture next week? Yep. Okay, thanks. Yes, Lama, we do, right? <laughs> yeah, hopefully. <laughs> okay, probabilistic. Okay, let's say yeah. 0.8. <laughs> <laughs> probability <laughs> yeah we are planning on so uh, oh, if anything sense, i will tell you i uh, yeah, yeah i think i think it would be a sensible yeah so anyway i understand that's the expectation in general yes um cool okay um again tusen tak and uh yeah have a good week guys and um see you next week yeah next week that's right bye bye